Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tyler Thorsted. I work at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in uh, the United States in, in Utah. Um, I am a, a preservation officer in our church history department, and uh, I'm going to give a presentation on resource forks today. Uh, it's something I've en enjoyed using most of my life uh, when kids my age back in the, in the 1980s were playing video games. I was trying to see what I could customize on all my Macintosh programs and games. So this has been something dear to me for many years. Um, so resource forks. Uh, how many here have heard of resource forks before? About half, great. How many of them have taken steps to preserve those in your digital preservation processes? Even less, okay. <laughs> How many of them, how many of you just throw them away when you see them? There we go. He was, he's proud of that one. He's like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about what they are and uh, kind of uh, hopefully bring some awareness to, to this kind of hidden world of Macintosh resource forks and, uh, and some, some of the findings that we had in our, in our group on how to best preserve them when needed. So... A Macintosh resource fork is something specific to, a, um, to the file system that, that Apple used on early classic systems. Um, I'm sure you've heard of HFS or hierarchical um, file system. And then there's the HFS Plus that came along a little later. But it basically um, saved file and divided the file into two forks, the data fork and a resource fork. The data fork is what we're used to seeing today it's what's copied over to a non-HFS device it's it's um, basically the data of a file but many files on early Macintosh systems could contain a resource fork that contained additional information and uh, and in the case of this hypercard um, file here that uh, I know the Library of Congress has been working on uh, quite a bit you can see that the resource fork is actually bigger than the data fork. And that's because it contains a lot of the sounds, the fonts, the, um, a lot of the graphics, um, and audio even, yeah, the audio and different things like that. Sometimes it even contains uh, some of the, the windows uh, and graphical interface that you'll see. <coughs> um, it also can contain a lot of icons for custom icons of the folders and things like that that some might find useful. Yeah. So you can see from um, this little graphic here that the, this kind of kind of gives an overview of a, of a simple Macintosh file um, that has a data fork and a resource fork. And a resource fork actually has a very structured, very well-known structure to it it's got a file signature and it's got the different resources in there that really help with <coughs> um, understanding uh, what's in there. But not every file needed one. Not every vendor used a resource fork. Uh, it kind of depended on how, uh, how much they wanted to put in there and also depended on cr cross-platform uses of the file. So if you found a lot of software that had a Windows and a Macintosh version, they tended not to use the resource fork because they knew it wouldn't transfer over. But many files did. Um, this presents a problem um, when we need to preserve this. So, so some special handling is needed in order to, to properly preserve this for the future. But I know many institutions will have different requirements for that. Um, I know many of you have probably seen in your processes a dot underscore file that has come along with some of your, your um, computer files, and many of us probably just toss those right away. <laughs> um, that, probably half the time that's probably okay. Uh, like a PDF file, it's not needed. But there are some, some cases that it's needed, and uh, there's lots of tools that you can use to determine what's in there. So hopefully by now um, my scheduled tweet has gone out uh, that has a copy of this data set that, it, that you're interest, if you're interested in looking at it a little closer. 
Um, we had a, a disc come into our institution that was a burned CDR from about 1996, and it contained multiple Pro Tools sessions from Pro Tools version 3. Um, it's an early digital audio workstation program that many people used, and it has the session files, so kind of like the project files that were included there, but then also had the original audio files that came with it for those projects. Now the problem is, is that Pro Tools um, versions 3 through 5 used a session file that only used the resource fork, did not use the data fork at all. So when you copy those files off of an HFS volume, they come over as zero kilobytes and uh, are easily dismissed or thrown away or in our case, when we tried to ingest those into our preservation system, um, they failed because this, we have a policy that zero byte files get flagged on ingest. So those failed, so we, we needed to look a little closer at this. Um, in addition to the Pro Tools session, there's an audio format that was quite popular during this time called Sound Designer 2. And those Sound Designer 2 files are kind of a problem because the audio is in the data track, but the information about the sampling rate, the channels, the um, duration, all that stuff is in the resource fork. So if those get split, then the data is kind of hard to interpret and hard to re-render. Um, so it's kind of considered a, a format that can't cross platforms very easily. Luckily, Pro Tools later on, um, when they tried to be more cross-compatible, um, switched to Wave, so you can use some of the later Pro Tools versions on a Mac to migrate your session file up, and it will convert those to Wave. And uh, the session file is no longer a zero kilobyte file. It's, uh, it's a little more useful. Um, but these resource forks were not really a, a new problem. The, the Macintosh users of the time realized that this was a difficult thing when they were trying to use the internet and using uh, online bulletin boards and AOL and all these things and emailing back and forth. So some, uh, some really great tools were developed at that time to help encode files for moving them across the internet through email and things like that. Um, let's see here. So uh, I took this, uh, this data set. I actually didn't take the, the actual files that we used, that we received in our institution. I created a new set um, that mirrored kind of the same properties and copied those to, uh, or made a disk image and then, and then created this data set. So we, we tried ingesting a disk image of the original H HFS volume. We just copied the material straight off into our, our ingest uh, workflow. Um, I also put them into a stuff it file, if, if some of you are familiar with that early um, compression program. It's kind of like a, the, it was the ubiquitous as zip is on the, on the windows at the time. Um, and then we also used a Mac binary oh, and an Apple single. And then the Apple double is those dot underscores that you guys have, have probably all seen that are almost created automatically when you're, when you're copying over. So we tried ingesting each of these different um, formats into our preservation system to see how they were handled because the, what we wanted to do is kind of do a round trip. We wanted to take that information that we knew was working, put it through these different types of, of container formats, if you will, put them into our preservation system, export them back out, and see if they rendered as we expected them to. Um, I think a lot of us are a little more, uh, when we get into the preservation system, we're kind of like, okay, it's preserved, I can move on to the next thing, but I think uh, kind of round tripping is a, is, a good, is a good practice when working with new formats to make sure we're not losing anything along the, along the way. So the results, uh, hopefully this slide also was tweeted out and on schedule. I know we're a little behind schedule, so it probably came out. I was hoping to time it all perfectly, but that didn't work. So uh, we used Rosetta um, in our preservation system. 
So that was the main thing that I had access to, to to do our testing. But I was also able to use a sandbox of Archimatica, and uh, David graciously ran it through Preservica for me to do a, a little test to see how, uh, if there was any variables that I, that I didn't take into account. Um, but they all had pretty similar results. There was a couple caveats. Um, our system had a policy that zero byte files would get flagged on ingest, but in Archivematica they seemed to just kind of go right through. So it may have been just because the sandbox I was using didn't have the policies in place. Um, also there's a hidden file uh, that was in, in some of them that has an icon that poor Richard had to deal with for his <laughs> bake off yesterday that had some illegal characters in it and uh, causes some, a lot of problems. So that also kind of got hung up in that logical copy that, that I used. So <clears throat> um, the, only, the only method in this process that lost the resource forks was this, was this logical copy. Um, some of the Apple doubles were able to make it through, um, but the, overall it was a very complicated process. So. Uh, the disk image worked really well because it was just a, 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 an image of the HFS volume. So it maintained the resource fork um, and the type creator codes, which um, is a whole other thing that I think we need to talk about in, in terms of file identification. Um, it, it maintained those, it maintained date, date stamps and all, all the fun things that we need in preservation. The disk image is, is um, fairly identifiable. And thanks to our Pronom team up at the back there, uh, version 108 came out last week and it included um, some signatures that I submitted for identifying more Apple formatted disk images and the uh, Mac binary format that I'm going to talk about here in a second. So identification is, works really well. Hard to validate some of the files in there, um, but there's no compression. And there's common software for mounting those disk images and reusing those, especially in emulation situations, which works really well. Logical copy, we've talked about, didn't work very well. Stuff It is a great program that a lot of people have used throughout the years to uh, keep the, the resource works together. It maintains you know, everything that the disk image did. Um, but those files are kind of invisible. Um, you can't, there's not much tools in our, in our preservation systems that can view inside of them to let us know what's inside. So all, the only identification that we get is a stuff it identification and not the Pro Tools information inside. Um, so there's no validation for much of that. Stuff it by default also compresses the, the file, but that is a, a toggle that you can do inside the software so you can, you can leave it uncompressed. And there's uh, stuff at Expander is fairly common throughout the classic environment and modern systems, so they're fairly easy to, to utilize. The Mac binary and Apple Single are um, both very similar. Mac binary was used quite extensively during this time. It's a way that we can encode a single file, into, uh, encode all that data into a single file. So it creates a header that's got the type creator, it's got the original file name, date stamps, puts the resource fork, and then puts the, um, the data fork all together. And it's how a lot of people use it to transfer over the internet back in those days. Um, but it's a single file, uh, you can't do folders with it, um, and it maintains everything. But they are single files, so they, they are a little bit more visible of what they are. Um, and now they're identifiable thanks to version 108 that came out. Um, and it's, there's a lot of fairly common software that can be used to um, kind of decode these on classic systems and current Macintosh systems. And encoding works the same way. Current Macintosh systems have a command line tool that can easily code and uncode, and there's, and there's third party vendors as well that does it. And Stuff at Expander handles them quite well as well. Apple Single was created a little bit later um, by Apple. And so it's very similar, does the same exact thing, but wasn't used as much in the classic days. So it's mainly more of a way to handle them on modern systems. And then Apple Double is, is similar. It just takes that resource fork and creates it into a visible 
single file that can be seen and, and identified and used, but remerging it back into itself on a classic system is kind of complicated and, and difficult. So, um, but it is possible. Let's see here. We're about running out of time here. So in conclusion, um, we decided to go with a disk image for this Pro Tools data set for our, for our use case because it was the entire disk and everything on it needed to be handled differently and we, we also converted a lot of the sound designer files to a modern wave um, for, for reuse. But we also had some later files that came in on different um, disks that were, that had regular files but then had a few files on it that were resource fork only. And in those cases, we decided to use the, the uh, Mac binary format to handle those. So probably depending on your institution and your needs, there's probably lots of choices to choose from. Um, there's multiple versions of Apple Single and multiple versions of Mac binary. And uh, we could probably get into the weeds there, but Mac binary 2 was probably the most commonly used Mac binary one is actually not in Pronom because it's very difficult to identify. And Mac binary three um, kind of came late, so you don't see as many of them. But we know our policies will continue to, to grow as we learn more and, and progress in our research. And, uh, but, we, but I'm hoping by running through this and presenting here that uh, I bring awareness to to preservation of these early Macintosh files and make sure that they are preserved. And um, I think the next steps are to, to go even further and to uh, ask groups that are doing file identification and, and validation to, to look a little closer at, at these type of files to help identify them and help us know what we have on our preservation systems. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Tyler. That was that was great. And uh, I'm one of the people who put their hands up to say we used to put those in the bin. <laughs> um, any any more questions? Great. I see a couple of hands there. Yeah. 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 Um, hey, Tyler. Ross. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ross Spencer, Robinsberger, Aga. Um, um, that was a great presentation, right? I think what's uh, really cool about it, for a start, is. Um, it shows that I think there's uh, some folks that think you can just just start putting everything into your preservation system, but there's, there really is a duty to do appraisal, not just for like from an archivist perspective, but from this preservation perspective, where you need to maybe approach things with different strategies each time. Um, I'm gonna ask. I think I think you probably expect me to know the answer, but I'm not sure I really do. I, I what I wanted to do was clarify a little bit. Um, about the challenge here and just ask um, uh, really simply um, it, it, perhaps to repeat the problem exactly around identification and just say I, I, I'll phrase what I think I heard um, and maybe it'll help the room as well. Uh, you, what you've got here is um, there's basically two digital objects that travel around with each other that are important for each other. Um, um, I, I'm seeing you nodding, but perhaps you can still respond in a, a second as well. Um, and also, it seems like there's no identification tools that that, that work in this way that use that that that, that you know, understand this connection between two things. Um, I just asked to ask you to confirm that as well, but also ask: is is there anything at all in any 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 of these like legacy file systems or Linux or something that already knows a little bit more about them than perhaps um, the Droid or Siegfried? Great question. Um, yeah, because of the because of the fork file on a Macintosh system, they appear as one, um, and and. The community that is doing Macintosh preservation, mostly with software and games, is very aware of this as well, and they take these extra steps to ensure their disk images are done properly to, to get all this information and then are preserved in a container that, that maintains uh, kind of that interoperability. Uh, 
in the in addition to the fork, there's actually a finder. The finder is kind of the explorer section of, of the Macintosh classic system. And in that finder, there's in the, in the file system stores a, a two um, four-digit codes that tell what software created it and what type of file it is. And that is how Macintosh got around the, the absence of an extension for most of their files that, uh, during that time. You've probably seen that a lot where things come over and they don't have a, 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 th a three-digit extension at the end. It's because Macintosh knew what they were. And if you created, say, a TIFF file in four different programs, if you clicked on that TIFF file, each one would open in their respective program, which in some ways was a more ideal way of doing it, but um, that can be debated. But there is tools on these Macintosh classic systems and tools in modern system that can quickly see those four-digit codes. And I think there is a lot of value to, in, in our archival world to then use that data to identify these files. Um, the, some of the, the screenshots I had were using a program called ResEdit that was quite popular for viewing these type of files and the, the information that goes along with it. Hope that answers your question. Hi, uh, Kieran O'Leary from the National Library of Ireland. Um, I just want to really thank you for like this incredible work and the contribution to the community. Make us rethink a lot of these things. Uh, you'd mentioned that like there's lots of times where you can't ignore, I guess, the double resource fork, yes. which I guess is the dot file. Um, for those of us who might receive a hard drive that's been created or that's you know comes from a Mac and it's got 5,000 JPEGs with 5,000 dot files, what steps can we? Are there some basic steps that we can take, even if it's looking in a hex editor or something, to say that, OK, we can ignore these? And when should we start taking it seriously? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I've, I've started a, a, a spreadsheet that has a lot of the formats that we've been getting in. And each time they've come in, I've evaluated how important the resource fork is to the preservation of that file. I think information like that needs to grow and, and, and be available to the community. Um, depending on whether you're evaluating on a Windows machine or a Macintosh, that could, it can be very different. Um, if you're evaluating an HFS disk on a Windows machine, a uh, tool like ISO Buster or uh, HFS Explorer can tell you if there's a resource fork and what, and what is included in that. Um, it can be a foreign language looking at it the first time, but once you understand it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and then if you're on a Macintosh, of course, there's uh, plenty of other tools that you can use to evaluate the value of those resource forks. Um, modern Mac, uh, so early Macintosh, um, they, they went from the classic system to Mac, Mac OS X, was, was in the early 2000s. They continue to use a lot of these uh, codes for use, but they also use the extension. So there was a, a quite a bit of crossover. So a lot of the things that we see from those time periods will still have those resource forks, but they are more modern versions of the formats, PDFs, JPEGs, Word docs, things like that. And they, they're all data fork heavy. So there's not a lot of reason to keep them. But um, I think a lot of people have found that out, so they just toss all of them. But I'm hoping that people will take a little closer look now when they're, when they're processing them. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Really interesting talk. As a former audio engineer, I'm very familiar with Pro Tools. <laughs> so in terms of like access to the Pro Tools sessions, are you migrating them to the newer versions, or are you just sort of opening up like a computer museum and showing them on the old version? Uh, that's, that's a very good question. Um, Pro Tools is difficult because of the, the uh, licensing and dongle restrictions. It's hard to keep uh, multiple versions available to do these migrations. So on this, on this particular file, we just migrated the Sound Designer 2 files to a, a modern wave, and then we're just keeping this disk image. And then if a later engineer wants to, dive back into those full sessions, they can figure that out on their, on their time. But, um, but yeah, there's, uh, there's different versions that you can, if you still have them, will open these earlier files if you're on a Macintosh and migrate them up. 
to the, the PTX format that is, is more common these days, which is also in version 108 that we were able to get a signature for for the, for the later version of Pro Tools. Okay, just got a gentleman down here at the front. Hello, I'm Steve Daly from the National Archives in the UK, and uh, for my confession, I also used to support Pro Tools systems for many years in a previous life. Um, but I was looking through a Droid backlog, and we, I, there's one ticket in there around this, around resource forks and Apple single files, but it, people seem to comment on it every few years. It's been sitting there a while, and it hasn't had much attention, I think. It's mainly you actually commenting on it occasionally. <laughs> um, but it, what Ross said was really interesting, the fact that there's this companion there's a file that accompanies mm -hmm. the main file, and a lot of the time it might not have value in there, but occasionally it might. I think it'd be really interesting to explore that, that functionality in Droid, to see if there was an ability to right. not, not just say th what this is, but give some flavor of whether there might be value in there. So, because it's a useful appraisal stage to, to really flag things that, that actually might be useful and might need some further attention. So I think it's worth fleshing out a ticket for that. Not to guarantee we'll do any development on it, but let's, uh, let's get a ticket where we sort of identify what the problem is. And then if, uh, if we find some resource at some point, we might uh, do a bit of work on that. It sounds yeah, interesting. I'm, I'm hoping so. And as, as resources grow for Droid, I'm hoping that we can, uh, we can tackle some of those more difficult questions. Because it really does come down to some of these more complex digital objects, which I know is kind of a frustrating topic in the identification world. And how do you keep, how do you identify a, a format that's got multiple parts? Um, and, and these Pro Tools sessions and uh, desktop publishing and, uh, and born digital video is all kind of in the same boat. So I'm hoping a lot more discussion can happen on that end. Yeah, because some of these formats are quite niche, but actually low, I think people will see hundreds of thousands of these little dot underscore files come past. And so there's a lot of stuff going in a bin and it would be really good to sort of make sure nothing valuable goes that way. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Sybil, any, any coming in? No, great. Just at the front here. Uh, John Tilbury from Preservica. Just to take that a bit further, it's, it's this whole family of multi-part objects, multi-part assets, an asset that is expressed by a number of physical files that, that, that Droid, Droid sort of covers because it covers container formats, which is exactly what those are, very often just zipped up things with multiple objects inside. But I think it's something that identification needs to work on. It, it's an email with attachment. It's a tweet with photos. It's a... Uh, 3D objects that have got uh, geometry files and texture files. You know, there, there's many, many examples that we're trying to build up in the product, but we're kind of doing it alone. We did a paper on this in iPress 2019, actually. But it's, uh, it is a family of, this is a very good example of just one of those, a, a multi-part object that you need to treat as a single information object. Right. Thank you. Uh, if, we, if we have time later on, we might come back to that, that theme. Okay, great. So, round of applause for Tyler. Thank you, Tyler.